Welcome to Macro Hype Conversations with Bilal Hafiz. We aim to bring you the best in macro and markets thinking. To see our latest thoughts and analysis on the world, visit macrohype.com. There's been a lot to talk about this week. We had Fed and ECB meetings, which allowed us at Macro Hive to assess what they've done so far. We invited rates guru George Kingalvis to write a Fed preview for Macro Hive, and then he updated his views after the meeting on the Macro Hive Slack channel. We also had two pieces on equity markets. One looked at what shape recovery US equities are currently pricing and where US equities would go in different scenarios. And we had another on how Fed policy is not actually supporting equities in the near term. Then we had a great piece on whether COVID will propel Bitcoin higher or not by commodity expert John Butler. On my side, I wrote a fun list of 37 ways COVID will change the world. You can get access to all this great content and our Slack channel by becoming a subscriber. It's great value, so do sign up. On to this episode's guest. We have the Financial Times Chief Economic Commentator, Martin Wolf. He likely needs no introduction, but I think he's one of the best economic thinkers around. He's been following economics and markets since the early 1970s and has been at the FT since 1987. He has lots of awards and honours, including a CBE, and he's also an author. His last book was The Shifts and the Shocks in 2014, which is an excellent read, and I understand he's working on a new book at the moment. We had a great wide-ranging discussion with lots of insights from Martin's 50-year professional career. So on to our conversation. Welcome, Martin, to our podcast. One of the joys always of speaking to you, Martin, is that you're very experienced. You've observed many economic and financial crises over the years. So how bad is this crisis? My first crisis as a professional was the first oil shock of 1974. I was then working at the World Bank in uh, my late 20s. But I was experienced enough to have some sense. And one had a sense with the first oil drop. You remember that the price of oil quadrupled yeah. overnight. So they, this seems staggering, right? Just think, you know, one day it's $100 and the next it's 400 And then, of course, it went with a war in the Middle East and a, and a blockade, uh, an embargo and oil shortages and all this. It was a big deal. Inflation yeah. exploded. And we did find it quite difficult to sort out what it meant. And the question we had is, is this a real, not only an important crisis now, is it an a important historical moment? In yeah. I think looking back on it, by the way, it's very clear it was. It was the end of the, 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 what the French call les trente glorieuses in the West. And, uh, and it catapulted us into a different world. So that was my first crisis. At the time, did you feel it was very important? Or in, in, in later years, you looked back and thought it was important? So this is very relevant to the discussion now. Is I did think about this a lot, but I didn't know. I felt that I didn't mm. know enough to know. Uh, what I did feel is that right now we were dealing with two things that are familiar, massive uncertainty. We really didn't know how this would end up. Mm -hmm. There were so many possibilities. And, and the second was an extreme urgency to manage it. I was in the World okay. Bank and we were talking about, you know, this was a stupendous shock for the developing countries. All the oil importers in particular, I was then working on India and yeah. it was suddenly bankrupt. <laughs> you know, how are we yeah. gonna deal with this? What were, so, we were mainly focused, as of course policymakers are now, in a very similar way, with the crisis of the moment. But ne necessarily, there were some very, very big questions about the future. I mean, one event, which I just suddenly remembered, was that when it looked as though the Russians were going to intervene in the Yom Kippur War, mm. Nixon put the entire nuclear armory of the United States on alert, uh, as to say, no, you're not going to intervene in the... <sighs> The Yom Kippur War, that's World War Three, And unfortunately, nothing happened. And for that reason, most of the people have forgotten. So it was a huge geopolitical economic crisis. And in this sense, a bit like today, is that it was an oil shock, which is a real shock, which generated lots of economic and financial disarray. 
But I think I was too young to really ask myself in an intelligent way, in a sophisticated way, what will this mean for the longer term, the very long term. In yeah, retrospect, yeah. it became clear that this oil shock and then the, the following oil shock five years later was a really important moment in world history. And I can think of three others before this one, the collapse of the Soviet Union between 89 and 91, the Soviet Empire, 89 yeah. and 91. Then 9-11, again, that looked like a decisive moment. Then the global financial crisis, I wouldn't put the Asian financial crisis that's significant in quite the same category, but yeah, we yeah. didn't know. Uh, then the global financial crisis and then this one. So there have been, in my career as a professional economist, now lasts about half a century, a number of really big events some political, some economic, some a mixture of them. Yeah. And I think one of the things that one would learn from these is that we should expect that. I think I've detailed one, two, three, four, five previous events. This is the sixth in 50 years. Well, that would suggest they come along at the rate of about one every eight or nine years. So do not think stable <laughs> equilibria are normal in the world. They aren't. And there are many other such events that could happen. Now, that's the first point. The second is, this is a unique event. I don't know whether it's the biggest of these. We'll come to this in a moment. It's unique. It's unique because, of course, it's triggered by a, a pandemic. And while pandemics are frequent in the history of the world, and there have been far more devastating pandemics than this one, probably the most significant ever was the Black Death, but I can think of many others. Uh, I won't go through all that history. Yeah. because It's something that really interests me, the history of pandemics and their effects mm. on world history. It's very clear that pandemics have had profound effects on world history. Uh, the, the Justinian plague probably played a decisive role in the success of the Islamic armies in the early 7th century, but I won't go yeah. into that. So that these are really big things. The Black Death ditto. Uh, this is the first time we've had a pandemic a bit like, which is in itself a bit like the Spanish flu of a hundred years ago, when yeah. governments had the capacity to respond in the way they've ha done. Yeah. To shut down or lock down their economies to deal with something like this. This is something that governments never could have done before. They didn't have the economies, they didn't have the mechanisms, they didn't have the insurance mechanisms. So this is unique. And speed and global impact is almost unique. The closest is obviously the Spanish flu, but the Spanish flu got mixed up with the end of the First World War. So it looks unique. And that means we're blind. We don't really know how these things will end. The third event, so it starts with a the pandemic, then the social and political response to that pandemic. And that is clearly generating an extraordinarily swift an extraordinarily deep recession, if recession yeah. is the right word. Collapse in economic output might be a better closure, shutdown of economic output. It looks to be likely, it's clear that it's going to be the biggest and deepest in terms of speed and scale, the uh, 1930s, and it is possible that it will be deeper than the 30s. I still am very optimistic that it won't be as prolonged or catastrophic politically, socially as the 30s, um, but it does look on that scale. So that means we have a real phenomenon, the pandemic, which is a hell of a wake up call for humanity, reminding us yeah. of our vulnerability and the things we don't control. It sort of undermines our arrogance, which is probably a good thing in itself. And then there is this extraordinary economic event. So whether it's the biggest thing in my lifetime, certainly unique, it's very significant. And if we mess it up enough, and we might, then I think it could well turn out to be a very major turnaround, turning point, a hinge moment in history. But that's because it will interact with other things that have been going on, rather as in retrospect, the, the two oil shocks also interacted with other things that were going on, which were not so clear at the time. And therefore yeah, yeah. they became, the two oil shops, I think, became really quite important events. I think without them, there would have been no Reagan-Thatcher revolution, for example. 
And then 9-11, in retrospect, looks to me relatively trivial. It seemed very important at the time. Yeah. It led to some important mistakes, which were pretty obvious at the time, obvious in retrospect, like the Iraq war. But in the end, the idea that we are at war with terrorism or that Islamic fundamentalism is the biggest threat to world civilization, both seemed to me then and even more now, completely absurd. How would you assess the different regional responses to COVID? One of the things that has interested me is how similar the response has been. And that's in a way is quite interesting. There are exceptions, important exceptions, but by and large, every country, not every country, but the majority of countries have in different ways decided that the priority is to get the disease under control. And even very poor countries have made this decision even very poor countries where it seemed to me a priori, quite reasonable to conclude that the impact of the disease itself was not going to be very significant. India is a very important case. I thought about it, Africa similarly, that given the age impact of the disease and given the demography of these countries, I thought the reasonable thing for them to do might be to say, okay, we'll let it go through our population. Uh, we have got a very young population. Nearly everybody will be fine. We can't afford to close down our entire economies because we simply don't have the resources to keep people alive or the systems to keep people alive, healthy, if they don't work for uh, two months. So the sensible thing to do is not to lock everybody down. But in fact, most governments have pursued not dissimilar policies. India is a very extreme example. China, too, uh, didn't take any such position. It went all out, I mean, just yeah. dramatically so, to squash the disease. So in that sense, the response, with a few well-known exceptions, to some degree Sweden, but the Netherlands a bit, Brazil, of course, uh, very all over the place, US is a federal mess, but basically everybody's done the same thing. And that's quite puzzling, given how different their circumstances yeah. are. And of course, people have, have nonetheless very different capacities to manage this in this way. The pressure to open up, econ reopen economies will be clearly vastly greater in countries with the economic ca characteristics and the demographics of, say, India. Uh, so many wage laborers, so many people dependent on the informal sector. Yeah such a limited fiscal and bureaucratic capacity to help them, they're bound to have to open this up. Elsewhere, of course, in developed countries, there are more choices, there are more trade-offs to be made. You can think of other options. So far, I think what's interesting is the similarity. Now divergence will happen. And I think the crucial point I would make, it's the only other point I would make, is it seems to me clear we're at a really early stage of managing this. And there are lots of things we don't know, cannot know, about what's going to happen next. The policy decisions we make, yeah, what yeah. will happen when we release the lockdowns, will the, the disease explode again or will it remain under control? Can we keep it under control? Will we be able to get reasonable cures to manage the disease? Will we get a vaccine reasonably quickly? Will the divergences in the situation of different countries be so great that we just cannot reopen travel again? Very plausible. Some countries are trying to eliminate the disease altogether, like New Zealand or Australia or South Korea. Otherwise, others are basically trying to manage it. Well, then how do you get free movement of people? So there are many questions about the future. And then there's, of course, the longer term legacy what sort of economic recovery in the end will we get? What will we do with the, the debt overhangs? What will happen to globalization in international relations? I mean, there are so many longer term questions. So I think we should stress that we've seen a common response to an immediate crisis and we don't really know what happens next. That came up very clearly in the IMF's forecast because yeah. depending on that, we will either get a good recovery or it's going to be terrible. Yeah. And on the economic recovery, what do you make of the economic policy response by central banks and finance ministries around the world? Let's break up the world into three segments. First is the major developed countries, by which I mean, and I would include China in this. That is okay. to say countries 
in this sense, which have substantial freedom, degrees of freedom, in what they do with their fiscal policies, how their central banks respond. I mean, China, because it's a closed system with a lot of foreign currency reserves and very strong central control. And of course, the major developed countries, the US, the UK, Eurozone, Japan, they have central banks which have can basically create as much money as they want in this situation. That gives their treasuries, their finance ministries, their governments, tremendous fiscal freedom. This is not uniform. We can get into the Eurozone. Obviously, the Eurozone can be generous, but generally, these countries have degrees of freedom. I think that, broadly speaking, broadly speaking, the response has been appropriate. In a crisis like this, the authorities, which in this context basically is the fiscal authorities and the central banks have to work together. They always have in the past. That's in the, in the end, the central bank is an organ of the state. It has to back up the state in the supreme crisis. It's always been the case in war finance. Take that, that the British case. You know, every time we got into a ma- major crisis, we went, the British up to the, the 1930s before, before we went off gold definitively, we went off gold. And why did we go off yeah, gold? Yeah. So the central bank could do whatever it needed to do to support the government in a yeah, war. Yeah. Now, this is sort of like a war. And so effectively, the same thing is happening. Now, there's no doubt, as I've written recently, there are lots of problems with this. Because one of the reasons we have so many problems in our economies is, in my view, we've got far too much debt. And, and a lot of it's going to be bailed out. And there are moral hazard issues involved with this, but you can't worry about moral hazard when you're in the middle of, of, you know, the fire of London. You just have to put out the fire. End of story. I think we can have lots of discussions of the details of the fiscal response. Should it be grants? Should it be loans? Who does it go to? But broadly speaking, the developed countries have done the right sort of things in getting support for people who are forced to stay at home so they can afford to stay at home, supporting business and trying to preserve as much of the the basic social and physical human capital of our economies intact through what we hope is a short crisis. Yeah, different yeah. governments do it in different ways because they have different structures, countries with relatively well-developed welfare systems find it easier to do this. They don't have to invent a lot. The Germans have done particularly well in this regard. But basically, they're all doing the same thing. And I think that's right. And I don't care about the debt. Okay. Basically, governments can finance this debt at fanta- for very long terms. I think they should go for irredeemables, at very low interest rates. So they should just go ahead. That's fine. Now, the second group of countries are emerging economies which have pretty well-developed domestic bond markets, are largely able to finance themselves domestically, have reasonably balanced external accounts, and are not enormously dependent on foreign capital. But nonetheless, their fiscal resources are relatively limited relative to the scale of the needs. To me, India is a very good example of such, that sort of country. A lot of countries in South and East Asia in, in this sort of position. And I think they are trying to do things not so differently from the developed countries. But of course, it's more limited. They can't go all out in this way. And I think that means that they will have to do this for a relatively short time. But in those cases, too, and I, again, I've just been discussing this, I think India can take on a significant more debt, provided it's clearly a one-off and provided it's linked with fiscal expenditures, which make a lot of sense in this crisis. And then there's a third set of countries, which can itself broken down into the middle income and the low income countries, which have before the crisis were already massively dependent on foreign capital inflows, continued to run sizable current account deficits throughout, whose private and or public sectors have a lot of foreign currency debt, And, well, they're in a mess, of course, because capital flight, the capital market implosion has led to massive capital flight. Their exchange rates have collapsed, which is fine in itself at the beginning of the adjustment, but it means they're going to have a lot of debtors 
private sector and public sector are basically bust. There will be an enormous amount of debt restructuring will have to be done. It's already clear in Argentina. We knew that before, but it's probably going to be a lot more. Yeah. And unfortunately, big failure. The resources needed to help these countries are inadequate. Uh, the IMF has pretty reasonable, you know, about a trillion dollars of lending capacity. The World Bank, other institutions have some resource availability, but I think it will turn out pretty soon it's not sufficient. I've been pushing for uh, ways of getting more help to them. And these countries will also, of course, need a lot of health help with the health system. And these countries would include countries like uh, you know, some of the Latin American countries like Brazil, Argentina, Turkey... In this case, there are two classes in this, as I said. Yeah. So we could go to three and four. There are middle income countries with very high external dependency, which basically tends to mean Latin America, a lot of Latin American countries, yeah. uh, South American countries, and definitely Turkey. Less true in Southeast Asia. Savings tend to be much higher. They're much, generally much stronger external balance sheets, much less dependent on enormous quantities of foreign currency borrowing. And then, of course, there are the low income countries. Yeah, I mean, yeah. and here we're particularly concerned with African countries, which they're mainly dependent, fortunately, though, mainly dependent on official creditors. Official creditors can, and I think pretty clearly are going to stop debt service requirements. It's yeah. easier to coordinate that in those cases, but they are going to need an enormous amount of assistance to deal with the health problems. So fortunately, and this is a very interesting feature of this disease, it does look so far that the health impact is biggest on countries which are relatively well off. And uh, that means that, that are relatively able to cope with it. And you mentioned the IMF, and that touches on a larger issue of you know, international organizations and how they're equipped to manage this global pandemic. So, for example, we have obviously the IMF and World Bank on, on the financial side. We obviously have WHO. We have G20. We have all of these international bodies. Yet, as we know, um, especially the US isn't really willing to give uh, much support to these organizations. How, how are you thinking about the, the international organization of the world right now in response to COVID? Well, I think there are two aspects of this and they're linked. I think the international organizations themselves, the fund, the bank, uh, the World Bank, the regional development banks have been very alert and have recognized the exceptional nature of the crisis and have been proactive. The one I tend to follow most closely, this is because I think it is the most significant as a sort of intellectual leader in dealing with crises of this kind, always has been. You know, going back to the first oil shock, um, they created a very special facility then, if I remember correctly, under the then managing director of the IMF, a Dutchman called Fittervein, who was a very fine, high quality MD. And there was, there was a, I think called the oil facility, I can't remember now. But anyway, the IMF has always been central. And I would have to say that as an institution, it's responded pretty well. It's okay, yeah. open for business. I think the current MD has done a, a good job in responding. How well this will all play out, I don't know. I imagine yeah, yeah. there will be lots of programs which, in the retrospect, don't seem to work. work. But you take risks in these situations. Yeah, yeah. And if some of them fail, then they fail. Uh, I think broadly what they've been trying to do is sensible. I think they've been actually coordinating, as far as I can see, with the World Bank and the WHO, not quite well. So I think at that level, if you like, at the yeah. institutional level, it's fine. The problem, of course, is the global context. Never in any of these crises before had the major powers of the world been so at loggerheads. Now, he, this is true on two fundamental dimensions. And we've been moving in this direction, but we're now we're there. I mean, in the first set of these crises, up to the global, up to and really including the global financial crisis, the players that mattered were the great Western powers, the G7. Yeah. And the G7, and above all, of course, primus inter pares, the US. We have lived, as I've said hundreds of times, obviously, in 
a US-led world since yeah. 95. And that continued to be the case unambiguously up to and through the global financial crisis. Yeah. But in the global financial crisis, with strong Western leadership, particularly quite surprisingly US leadership, even under George W. Bush, and then, of course, even more under Obama, they reached out and got the G20 involved. And of course, the most important player in that was China. And it turned out that China's role in the last financial crisis was very, very helpful because it decided, partly for its own reasons and partly because it fitted into the global context, to mount a massive stimulus in 2009. And that was incredibly helpful for the global recovery, particularly for emerging economy recovery. We started the commodity boom, it was all great. And that was partly a product of the G20. The G22 agreed on a whole range of responses, including reform of the financial system. The Financial Stability Board, for example, came out of the, and the tighter Baal rules on, Basel rules on banks, which are linked, came out of the G20, which came out of the crisis, which came out ultimately of G7 leadership. So I would yeah. say up to and including the financial crisis, we still had a relatively coherent Western world. The big exception of all the crises I've talked about was of course the response to the 9-11 event, which led to this big slit in the G7 then, with Britain okay, yeah. and US going off to war and the everybody else saying, you're crazy, rightly as it turned out. Now, fast forward to where we are now. That world has disappeared on three dimensions. One, we have a new great power, a new superpower, China, yeah. which is clearly one of the world's greatest economies in size, though still a relatively poor developing country. It feels its power, and it's in a pretty adversary relationship, which has not been helped by this pandemic because of the debate about what China did to create it and failed to deal with it. The result is that China's relationship with the West in general, and the US in particular, is really pretty damn bad. Vastly worse than it was 12 years ago. Uh, and that makes it very difficult to handle the world. Second, the West is disintegrating as a system. The relations between America and the major European powers in Japan were, despite frictions, you know, Nixon 71, another event that I could talk about, significant. I was also working at the World Bank when that happened. But despite the shocks and differences and difficulties, in the end, America was the leader. Everybody accepted America was the leader. And the alliance in the economic and other respect was pretty damn coherent. That's gone. It's gone first. Britain has left Europe, which isn't quite important in this context because Britain really was in 2008 9 the sort of intermediary uh, between the US and yeah. Europe. Gordon Brown played a really successful role in bringing people together at that stage. An underestimated value of our being in Europe is that we always had very good relations with America, of course, for these reasons of culture and history. And at the same time, we were part of Europe, and that's gone. Uh, and then, of course, we have Trump, whose yeah. attitude to Europe is that it's a hostile power and we should break it up. And then finally, of the three things that have happened, the US itself has become profoundly inward looking, completely and demonstrably incompetent in a way that one would never have expected. The one yeah. thing the world thought about the US is we might not like it that much. We varied in what we thought about it. And we knew that it didn't necessarily respond to crises quickly. But in the end, the US sorted itself out. Its resources, human, physical, yeah. ecological, were unparalleled. And when they brought to bear all that on a crisis, they just dealt with it. And that is what we would have expected them to do with this. But they're not. And in the meantime, the US is basically intensely inward looking. For these three reasons, the capacity of the power system, which is what the international system ultimately depends yeah. on. I've written this many, many times. We have a global cooperative order. We have global multilateral institutions and multilateral yeah. rules, but they're all ultimately rooted in the legal and political orders of states. 
and particularly yeah. of major states. And if the major states' political and legal orders no longer support this global system, it disintegrates. And that, I think, is where we are. And that makes it very, very difficult to coordinate anything in a coherent, effective, immediate, forward-looking and intelligent way. And that's demonstrably the case in this crisis. And of course, it means that it makes you know, we've got the US leaving the WHO in the middle of this pandemic. It's just yeah. incredible. We're not reforming it, not saying we need it, a better one, just leaving it, just as they left the climate, the Paris Agreement on climate. We have Europeans who are inward looking and the Americans have gone and just obsessed with their, their internal problems. The Britain is God knows where in all this. Japan is on its own. There isn't a world order of any kind. Now, that's a very, very big deal. Do you think there's a parallel with the early 70s with the breakdown of Bretton Woods? Because obviously that, that was the um, kind of the world order after the Second World War, Bretton Woods. It broke down and so the world had to get used to kind of a new arrangement. Do you think there's parallels with that? Or perhaps even the early 90s, the breakdown of the Soviet Union, the end of the Cold War... Do you think we can draw some parallels with that or not? Yeah, I think the parallels with the early 70s, I've already suggested, the 70s were a hinge decade in retrospect, yeah. and there were many things going on. It looked very bad. You had the oil shocks. You had Nixon, who was the president closest to Trump as a nationalist since the war. I mean, his administration was incomparably more competent than Trump's administration, and he was an incomparably more se serious human being, though I think an appalling one. But there was a lot going on in that administration, which is pretty impressive. Think about the opening to China, for example. There's no comparable thing under Mr. Trump. But Nixon's 71 shot, the going off gold, which meant breaking up the Bretton Woods system, as you say, moving to floating. In, it was a bit of a mess, but that's what happened. The import surcharge, which was a real missile at the then trading system, the general agreement on tariffs and trade at that stage. It, then we had very high inflation. So the monetary order was breaking down. International monetary order was breaking down. It looked as though the trading system was in terrible danger. And this was, in addition, went along with a very significant political crisis in the US, which linked Vietnam, big deal, the end of the Vietnam War, and the yeah. American's first major international defeat, and, let's put it, the revealed crookedness of the president. Yeah. So this was a very big crisis, and that is in many ways the closest parallel overall to where we are now. The differences are, or at least in retrospect, it's pretty clear. The crisis was still a crisis of the West. There wasn't anyone else who mattered. Russia was a, Soviet Union was a great power, but it was completely outside the system. And so the West could sort it out. And in the mm. end, the West yeah. did sort it out. It turned out, though it took a decade, that, and it was very painful, that measures could be taken that would deal with most of those problems. So had the Volcker shock, sold out inflation, they got rid of Nixon, the American Constitution came to operate, we had the Volcker shock, so inflation was driven out. This is all these crazy, lots and lots of problems, by the way, the, the debt crisis, lots of them, all linked with this, the developing country debt crisis. But still, yeah. they got rid of that. Then there was a, a new political order built around a, re a resurgence of belief in free markets and international trade. So that, that re-emerged as a big theme and the fall of the Soviet Union further strengthened that. So by 1990, okay. it looked as that was all, it was an important change, but it wasn't a, in the end a completely disruptive one, although that can be now debated. Now, I would say now there are many parallels now but there are a couple of new challenges. Yeah. I would say, but this may be wrong, that the disintegration of the American system is more profound than in the 70s. The, we will see. The disintegration of the Western system is more profound than the 70s, because ultimately, as long as the Soviet Union was around, Europe and America had to go together. That was a great help. Maybe China will bring them together again. That's, I'll come to that in a moment. And of course, there was no China. 
uh, that was just the Soviet Union, which we were familiar with. And by the mid 70s, people had sort of come to the view, in the end, the Soviet Union is an enemy, but it's not winning. In the 60s, there were early 60s, there was still a view when Khrushchev said, we will bury you, that what didn't seem ridiculous. By the mid 70s, that began to seem completely ridiculous. So the Soviet Union was seen as a military threat, to some degree an ideological threat, yes. But, and, what, and then we managed to, the Americans managed to split China from the Soviet Union. That was a big deal. So the geopolitics didn't look so bad either. But in the end, we got out of that through a great deal of creative diplomacy and creative policy making and creative politics. And as always, successes, and there were some real successes, lead to new and in some ways even deeper problems. But at this stage, all I would say is these, the challenges we now confront on the dimensions I've described yeah. look bigger than then, to me, somewhat bigger and more complicated. But I still think they're all manageable and they're manageable in a number of different dimensions. So I don't want to leave people with a overwhelmingly <laughs> pessimistic sense. I still have the optimistic view, which could turn out totally wrong, that peoples of today, whether they're in major countries, whether they're democracies or dictatorships, I much prefer democracy, will not tolerate totally incompetent, totally stupid, lying governments forever. That in the end, they will rebel against that. Please, God, we really don't want to repeat <laughs> the 30s, do we? Second point, which I think is very, very important if going to be positive, the people of the world, and particularly the peoples of the great powers, unlike in the 30s, nobody thinks, I think nobody thinks, let's have a world war, what fun it would be. Nobody wants large-scale conflict. And that's because our people want, basically want, we are, this is the Stephen Pinker point, we live in an era in which everybody sort of wants peace, yeah. better lives, prosperity, very difficult to do with given climate and all that. But the aspiration of politics is towards stability and peace. China, remarkably, is a point that people ignore. You know, under Mao, China had armies, every, you know, had, it was intervening in conflicts all over the world. China has no foreign adventures at all anymore. It's, yeah. it's got the South China Sea thing, which we consider entirely defensive. But unlike the US, I mean, China is, is completely domestically focused from a military point of view and its security point of view. It's not trying to export its ideology, which does not mean that I like the Chinese system, but that's not the point. China is essentially a country that wishes to develop itself. Well, I don't see why we couldn't, can't live with that. The same is true of India. Essentially, it's, that's what it wants to do. I think it's true of every country in the world. They want better lives. The people want it. And if you get leaders who are hopelessly incapable of delivering it, I tend to hope that they will be got rid of. We will see. So my basic view is that there's a pretty good chance, pretty good chance that we can get through this as we got through the 70s, messy and perfectly into a world which is adequately cooperative, will sufficiently deal with its big challenges, including this, and at the very least, the pandemic has reminded us of one really, really important thing as climate change should, but it's much slower, which is there are challenges out there which are by their very nature global. The pandemic yeah, yeah. is global. It cannot be dealt with by nations entirely on their own. You can't be an island of peace and stability if there's a raging pandemic in the rest of the world. If we want to get rid of the disease in our countries, we have to help get rid of it everywhere else. And we are all human. And then there's the incredibly obvious and deeply, I think, emotional fact, which mm. I've written in the columns, in a couple of columns, I think, at least one, which is the very fact that the disease can affect any of us reminds us that we, are, we share one thing, which is quite obvious. We're all human beings. So maybe a pandemic itself by its very global nature and its impersonal nature is something that has to remind us in the end of what we share rather than what divides us. However huge the challenges of today, I think we have the resources to deal with it. 
globally, have the resources to deal with it, medical and financial, and we have the reason to do it. And I think the great majority of human beings will want us to deal with it and go into a world which is continues to be reasonably stable, reasonably peaceful, not saturated with rage and driven by incompetent and mendacious leaders into completely unnecessary and foolish conflicts. But who knows? On China, you touched on earlier that the international community may view China negatively because there's the whole question of did they let the world know soon enough about the virus and so on. Yet at the same time, looking at how countries have dealt with the virus, you know, China seems to have managed it relatively well, especially when you compare uh, how slower the countries were. So in terms of competence, China kind of stands out a bit and it's been exporting face masks and PPE equipment and so on. How, how do you think, maybe a few months away, but how do you think the different parts of the world will view China? Ah, that is a very, very interesting question. So I really don't know. And of course, in assessing the performance of different countries and groups of countries, one has to do it in relative terms. So, you know, relative to whom? At the moment, it looks to most of us as though the countries that have done best of the larger countries are the South Koreans and the Taiwanese. We're not yeah, allowed yeah. to say it's Taiwan is a country. Yeah. Uh, I don't care. Which are democracies. Let's stress this because it shows yeah. a very important thing that democracies can deal with these problems. And that's been true of one or two of the countries in Europe too. But it's relative to others. And obviously, in terms of getting a grip on the disease from a, once it became obvious it was there, it was serious, the Chinese have done much, much better than the Americans and many other European countries. So relative to the West, in terms of dealing with the disease, once it was evident, China looks in its brutal way, as it were, from our point of view, pretty effective. And it looks as though it will have the resources, though in a very intrusive way, which we probably would find problematic. And that's one of the big questions ahead. How much yeah. privacy do we go up, give up in order to be safe and all the rest of it. Uh, but they have used their re technological resources, which are remarkable now, what they can do with surveillance technology, artificial yeah, yeah. intelligence and all the rest of it to monitor their vast population is at the same time impressive and frightening. But that looks quite impressive. So it's the first big point. The second point, of course, is that nonetheless, the disease clearly originated in China. Nobody knows quite how, because it's not been investigated. And it's pretty clear too, no, it's not pretty clear, it's certain that the initial reaction of their system was to suppress the knowledge. And indeed, to suppress the people who were brave enough to point out that this was happening. And that's a tremendous failure. You can't get around, that's a tremendous failure. Here was what turns out to be a tremendous global threat originating inside this country, and China failed to deal with it. And there have been other diseases that originated in China where the same happened, SARS most notably, yeah, and yeah. fortunately that just didn't happen to, to spread across the whole world because of yeah. the nature of the disease. So there's a problem here, and that's a problem that ought to affect people, how people look at the Chinese system, I think. And more important, it's a problem the Chinese themselves ought to be very concerned about. And that leads me to a third point, which is at the end of all this, I think, uh, instead of everybody pointing a finger at everybody else and everybody yes. saying, look, th this shows that China's superior, or this shows America's superior, all this absolutely absurd nonsense, juvenile nonsense, we would say, look, this has been a sort of near-death experience for the economy. But truth is, we could have far worse pandemics than this. And we might. I mean, remember, I've been thinking about this over the last 40 years, we've had a 
a large number of very significant new diseases. HIV AIDS, which was a yeah. terrifying thing when it emerged and has killed many, 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 many millions. We've had Ebola, had SARS and MERS. I missed one other. We've got this, but this is just 40 years. Well, we might have lots more and they might be much more infectious and much more fatal. So what we have to do after this is over uh, is to investigate what happened here. Why did it happen? How should we respond? How do we create the capacity to recognize, respond, deal with the disease and its economic context, consequences globally, quickly? What research capacity do we need? What redundant medical capacity do we need? What financial capacity do we need? What international organizations do we need? What do we need to do with the WHO to make it more effective and more legitimate? Mm. What should China have done differently? What should we in Europe and America have done differently? How should we have helped? How should we dealt with the transport issues and, and the testing issues associated with the movement of people around the world? There are so many questions yeah, that yeah. we have to learn answer now because my strong guess is this is going to happen again maybe not next year but uh, you know, maybe in the next 20 years or maybe longer maybe sooner maybe much worse yeah, yeah. so instead of i think pointing fingers so that's very important we should take the approach which i think the the air traffic accident approach which is Every accident is investigated. It's investigated the full. The purpose is not to pin blame on people because it's pointless. The point, the purpose is to learn. And what you'll want to learn is how do we make sure this doesn't happen in this way again? And that's what I would like to see happening at the end of this. And fortunately, so many people screwed up in so many different ways. <laughs> Yeah, I guess. Uh, it seems to me nobody will, should be allowed to feel at the end of this, well, it's all their fault. It really isn't all their fault. Yes, there are big questions about China, but that doesn't explain why the Americans or the Brits have been so incompetent. We haven't talked as much about Europe. How, how do you think the European Union and the Eurozone has coped with the COVID? And, and how do you think it will look after COVID, Europe, the EU, the structure, the ECB, and so on? This is a fantastically big question. Well, how has it coped? I would say that as a European Union, it has coped very badly. The European states have coped to different degrees, with different degrees of success. And there seem to be somewhat random elements to who got hit hardest and why, which I don't fully understand, uh, but may have to do in part with quite accidental features about who just happened to get the disease first, and also with patterns of social living. So it just so happens, uh, it seems to me, that in the Italian case, the Spanish case, People tend to live, which in many ways is a very satisfactory way of living, in multi-generational households. Yeah. And the result is, and a multi-generational household is obviously a perfect way of spreading the disease to old people. But then we, we managed to do it in a not dissimilar way to those old people who are for, unfortunately in care homes. Yeah. So there are accidental features. But individual states have responded and individual states have the resources, by and large, at least in the short run, to uh, respond after a lot of mistakes in the same sort of way. And the disease is being brought under control, at least in this first wave. I would stress it might well return when we go back to normal. So the, at the nation state level, we could say di very divergent, but everybody is sort of getting into control. European Union collectively has, I thought, think done pretty badly. They've imposed restrictions on movement. They've outmoved, so it's no longer an integrated area from the point of view of movement. There have been export controls. 
within the union. There has been minimal fiscal solidarity. It's still the case. A sort of sense that, well, everybody's on their own. They've un been unable so far to create a really effective and common response of a financial fiscal type through European institutions, EU institutions, sorry, EU institutions. And so the, the effective institution, and it's been very, very important, was the ECB. And after some important missteps in the initial, yes. I think the ECB has been reasonably effective. But this is very early days. The politics are still to play out. The sense of abandonment in Italy, which I know better than Spain, is, I think, very great. However, to some degree, but still to a significant degree, reasonably so. They feel they were abandoned over immigration from North Africa and abandoned over this. They had largely abandoned in the, in the financial crisis, in the first financial crisis, and the subsequent Eurozone crisis, tremendous shift in opinion away from the Eurozone in Italy, I think to some degree now in France and Spain. So a big north-south rift, and the, that's the politics. Tremendous difficulty in agreeing on a collective response. So I've always seen what keeps the EU together is put it very simply in two words, fear and hope. The hope is that by maintaining the European Union and solidarity in the European Union, they can su sustain a peaceful, prosperous, integrated economic and political system among the European states uh, and thus continue the great effort to, to, to transcend the old history of national division, which led to the two world wars. That's the hope. And the fear is, of course, the consequences of breakup. The, the breakup of the currency union, the breakup of the trading system and the rest of it. I would say that the hope part has weakened progressively. And it's weakened progressively because a lot of the people who really felt that, or basically all the people who really felt that, were people who went through the Second World War and they're all dead. And their younger generations don't understand this moral, emotional, fund in their hearts. They don't feel in their bones the fear that led to that hope the feeling they had to do better than they'd done in the first half of the 20s. Yeah. So I would say the aspirational side of Europe is relatively weak. There are leaders like Macron who feel it strongly, but I would say they're rather on their own now compared to the leaders of 30 years ago. All of the leaders of 30 years ago would have shared this view that the European project is a great dream, and I think that's really not there anymore. And lots of them don't feel it at all. And the fear side, yes, that is definitely there. Nobody really believes that breaking up the Eurozone or the even more the EU would be a tremendously good idea. But the irritation with one another is so great that accidents can happen. If the ECB stops, is forced politically or legally, or both, to stop its support. And the Italians are on the verge of actual default on their debt, and nobody comes to help them. Would the Italians be willing to go through a default experience while remaining in the Euro? It would be quite a crisis for their economy, it would take down their banking sector, probably. Nobody knows. Would anyone help them in that situation? Quite possibly not. So I tend to the view that inertia is very great. The fear factor is still there. There's some of the hope factor still there. And therefore it will be okay. But I've always felt the currency union was a tremendous gamble. It's still, the nature of the gamble is obvious. It is a gamble. 
and uh, on political solidarity within inevitable crises. They sort of only just got through the last one, but yes, they yeah. did. I am optimistic they will again, but I'm not sure. And ultimately, while we think of this in economic and financial terms, which is correct, because that's where the crisis, the pressure comes from, the responses are ultimately political. Will senior policymakers and parliamentarians, politicians across the union feel when the moment of the real moment of decision comes, as it did with Greece in 2015? Yes, we have to save it. And the honest answer is, I don't know, and I think they don't know. How, how do you think economies are going to look different uh, after COVID? So the structures of economies, will, will restaurants still be open and so on? Do, do you think there'll be permanent changes in the structures of economies going forward? This has several dimensions. The way I think about it is so, sort of, sort of what, what do we know will be different? And what might be different? And how will we respond to either? I would stress, first of all, that a lot of what's going to happen depends on decisions that haven't been made. Now, the first thing we do know is there will be, a, for sure, is there will be a lot more public debt. And we know that we will come out of this with very large fiscal deficits. And we will come out of this with economies that are significantly smaller, matter of question of what's, how big the significant is, than we thought they would be in, say, 2024, 2025, last year. Whatever they're going to be by 2030 or 2040, I don't know whether the nature of the recovery, I think it is as near certain as can be that in 2025, certainly 23 and 24, economies will be enormously much smaller than we yeah. thought they would be, maybe 10% smaller than we thought they would be, even if there's a good recovery, at least 5 or 6% smaller than we thought they would yeah. be. And I try to remind people that if you've just looked at our last financial crisis, and you thought, as most people did, by the way, most forecasters did, that in 2007, that the economies would sort of continue to grow more or less as they had, a bit more slowly because of demography. Then, so when you look at GDP per head rather than GDP, well, basically, you assume GDP per head will continue to grow as it did before. A bit more optimistic given yeah, aging, yeah. but so our economies are already varying between about 15 and 25 percent smaller in 2019 than they would have been if those trends had continued. And that reduction in GDP per head relative to pre-crisis trends explains a lot of the misery in the developed world, in my view. Now this is going to happen again. So that raises one very different, difficult question. How are we going to manage being poorer, having bigger fiscal deficits, partly because we're poorer, and much more debt than before? And I don't know how this will play out, but what is obvious is the austerity debate will be there again, and in a very different political context. My prediction, unless we go full fascist, go full plutocratic, which is possible in the US in particular, that you know we go back to the tax cut and gender, slashing spending and crunching the poor, as it were, the overwhelming likelihood is that as we come out of the crisis, we're going to see higher taxes for well-off people. I can't see any other way out of this, and particularly well-off older people. We're going to have to, we cannot handle austerity, the austerity problem again the way we did before, and that will mean that a lot of the fiscal adjustment will come through higher taxes. It can't come overwhelmingly by reducing spending relative to GDP trends as we did before which is how I define yeah. austerity last time. We reduced spending relative to GDP trends. Yeah, and yeah. We forced public spending to grow at an incredibly low rate for a long time. I don't yeah. think that can be done again. It can't be done because we're going to have to spend, we're going to have to deal with the deficits. We're going to have to deal with the continued and rapid aging of our society. And we cannot put all the burden on the young. 
So yeah. I expect to pay a lot more tax. And I think that's right. But this is going to be one very big mm. issue. Subject to that, and that's to do with the running deficits, I think we can handle the debt uh, because I think interest rates, real and nominal, will remain low. And yeah. that will make it manageable even if growth rates are very weak. But debt sustainability will be an interesting challenge. It's why I think that governments should go out right now and basically borrow very long term and refinance debt very long term at as low interest rate as they can. Uh, but so this is one absolute certainty, and I don't think we should ignore that. Now, the second, then we get to two questions. And one of them is implied by your question and one isn't. One is structural, as you suggested. I'm prepared to bet that if we get the disease fully under control such that we no longer care about it at all, you know, we just feel safe. I think a vast proportion of the population, above all the relatively young, will want to go out, travel, party, enjoy themselves, in any way they can. So I like to remind people, remember that the first world war and the Spanish flu were succeeded by the roaring twenties. And the roaring twenties weren't an accident. People were saying, young people in particular, we've been through this horrendous event. Vast numbers of people have died. Our contemporaries have died. We don't want to go to, back to the stuffy old Edwardian age. We want fun. And I think that's what they're going to want. Enough death and misery and fear. So actually, I tend to the feeling that travel, restaurants, entertainment will return big time. And the structural shifts in our economies will not be. And face-to-face -face contact. People have an immense hunger from a social point of view. I'm not talking about work. For being with, with one another in, in the room, particularly young people. So they're going to go back to it. Uh, maybe not me, but, uh, but yeah. they are. And I must say, I would like to travel again. So I think that won't change, assuming that we get the disease under control. What I do think is quite likely to change is a different aspect of structure, which is technology, which is I do think that technology has improved so dramatically in terms of being able to work together effectively online, having discussions online. I mean, for me, participating in our leader conferences every day online, they're at yeah, yeah. least as effective as they were when we were in the same room. Yeah, now, of yeah. course, that's a lot because we know one another very well. We can deal with one another very well. So you still have to meet young, new people, entrance into your business still, you have to meet. We won't get rid of that, but I wouldn't be very surprised if a lot of people concluded after this, you know, working at home isn't so bad. Let's actually reorganize our working lives. So we do much more of that relative to going this ridiculous commuting business. Why should you spend two hours a day um, going from A to B? It's complete dead time. So I think moving into the virtual world in that sense, as seems to have happened to, though I've not experienced this so much in our social interactions. I'm not really part of that. I don't do social media. But I do think that could be a very profound shift, which has been accelerated by this shock into the virtual. The final thing where things might change is linked in many different ways with what we were talking about throughout this conversation, which is globalization, integration. I think that the shock of this coming across a lot, not so long after the world financial crisis is going to raise questions about, and the political disorder we've talked about, raise questions which already been there about what's going to happen with international economic integration. There are questions here in many dimensions. Will emerging countries go back to accepting willingly large inflows of private capital, which they've seen once again can flee so quickly and on such a massive scale, creating such a shock. Maybe they will say to themselves, I think they should say, we should have much tighter capital inflow controls 
and be more self-sufficient in finance. I'm not saying it will happen, but that's one possibility. Second, supply chains. There were already stresses on supply chain, but here people will start saying, look, there are essential goods, health goods, a few other things which we have to be able to supply ourselves or at least stockpile plus supply ourselves or supply from countries we really trust, particularly we don't really trust that markets will remain open. So we've got to change that big time. And of course, there was already a lot of pressure saying, well, actually we have to bring supply chains home or diversify them. All of this will transform the highly integrated, just-in-time global production system we've generated in the last 40, 30 years, say 30 years, maybe 40. And this could be an accelerant. We already saw globalization shrinking, and maybe that will be accelerated further. And then finally, linking into this second aspect, global yeah. order, that will link with the politics, the role of the US in the world, its increasingly inward-looking nature, possible, please God, no disintegration of the EU. So we might be seeing, and this would be the sort of what I have argued is the great mistake of the 30s is they had this monstrous depression, which is perfectly yeah. awful, which would never have happened. And they reacted to the Great Depression by going to massive protection, which was a second round of disaster imploding or helping to implode world trade. So we might make that mistake. I think it would make recovery much more difficult. But it may be that when we come out of this, the globalizing stroke, globalized world which was already a bit sick since the global financial crisis, will essentially be in more or less terminal crisis. Of course, for business, you know, what does this mean to take the thing at home? For global Britain, we will be outside the EU, idiots. We will, apparently, we looks as though we're going to have the hardest of all exits from the EU. Well, the US is getting increasingly protectionist. That's how it looks to one, at least at the moment, maybe yeah. one. Does anyone think China is going to be an easy game for opening up the economy right now? So that could make uh, the world look very, very different from the world that was assumed in, say, in the UK, just to take this example, four years ago during our referendum, a point I've made frequently, which is now much worse. So in these three ways, in yeah. some respects, I think the world might not change as much as many people think, but there is this huge fiscal change. There's no doubt about that. Maybe we'll have hyperinflation. I don't think so, but we, we haven't had time to go into that. Yeah. But we've got this huge fiscal change. We've got the technological change, and then we've got this change about the globalized world. And I think in these, this last one, yeah. we don't know where it will go, but at least we have to wonder whether this is a decisive moment. Well, that was uh, excellent. I think on that note, I think we could wrap up our conversation. We've talked about so much and as well as some of the more sort of pessimistic perspectives, there's a lot of optimism in, in, in there as well. So we don't need to uh, think it's all doom and gloom. All the crises I mentioned, we've got through. Yeah, One has to yeah. hope we will manage to do it again. And just for our listeners, what's the best way of following uh, your thinking and your work, uh, Martin? Well, I don't tweet. I have a robot that the FT has a robot who tweets uh, okay. myself. So basically, the answer is, apart from the occasional book, and I'm writing one at the moment, the basic way is to read the Financial Times. Uh, I am a regular columnist there and do unsigned pieces as well. But basically, I'm a regular columnist. So if you want to know yeah. what I think about things, read the Financial Times, which is in any case, of course, the best newspaper in the world. <laughs> of course <laughs> great so thank you very much martin great pleasure thanks for listening to this episode please subscribe to the podcast show on apple spotify or wherever you listen to podcasts leave a rating and let other people know about the show also sign up to become a subscriber at macrohive.com we'll be back soon so tune in then